Well, as you can see, I'm back in Lethbridge at the courthouse. I think I've visited this place more often than any other location in the country besides my home or my office. You know, Starbucks talks about being the third place. You go to the office, you go home. Where's that third place you go? That's Starbucks's internal strategy. This is my third place. If I'm not at home or at work, odds are I'm here. And that's because this is the closest courthouse to the Alberta-Montana border. Coots on the Alberta side, sweet grass on the Montana side, where two years and a month ago, a bunch of truckers and farmers and other ordinary Albertans had a blockade in sympathy with the main trucker convoy in Ottawa and a secondary one in Windsor. Now, police sort of blocked access to Coots, which is a very small village. It's not even a town. They blocked it off at a, at a larger town called Milk River. It's like they built a giant siege wall around Coots. You couldn't get past Milk River. You couldn't uh, bring supplies to people. You couldn't bring food to people. It really was um, a showdown of sorts, whereas Ottawa and Windsor are large cities with huge police with lots of resources. Coots is far away. So the police couldn't go in and pull out the protesters easily. In fact, they had one sort of attempted show of force. The men just simply outnumbered them. And by the way, those huge agricultural vehicles, they're even harder to move than the trucks. Here's a scene from one of our documentaries on Coots showing that tense moment where all the troops sort of marched out and the, the men just, protesters just sort of said, hey there, we're not going anywhere. I don't know if you remember this. Well, of course, the law gets the last laugh. They charged a lot of people there. Now, again, what are they going to charge them with? Some parking offense? Well, in the case of Pastor Arthur Pavlovsky, they charged him for giving a sermon to the men, which they said incited their mischief. And incredibly, he was convicted of that crime. Rebel News is crowdfunding, along with the Democracy Fund, the legal funds, not only for his trial, but for his appeal. Again, that was in this building because, of course, this is the closest courthouse to Coots. A lot of men there were charged with mischief, which normally is the really the most minor offense in the criminal code, something reserved for, like, uh, I don't know, someone who kicks over a garbage can or something or, I don't know, spray paints graffiti. Really, there's not a lot more you can charge the trucker protesters with. Um, the worst they did in Ottawa was some parking offenses and horn honking. That's why they're coming against Tamara Halich with, I think it's incitement to commit mischief. That's so minor. I, I really think it's the longest trial, hers is, the longest trial of any Canadian ever charged with mischief. It's been going on for months and it's not done yet. Well, here in um, Lethbridge, there's several trials for people who are involved in coots. In fact, the Democracy Fund and Rebel News have crowdfunded for 55 people, 55 truckers um, who were arrested or ticketed or charged with one thing or another. That's on top of other pandemic issues. So there's a lot going on. The Coots 3 case, I don't mean to confuse you, but just to be clear, the Coots 3 are the so-called leadership group. They've been charged with mischief, much like Tamara Leach and Chris Barber in Ottawa. But what I was here for is the so-called Coots 4, and I, and I know it's very confusing, but those are the four men who were charged one day with a very serious crime of conspiracy to commit murder. And the, the police made such a shock and awe show of it. They had a carefully staged press conference where they showed weapons, which are just regular hunting weapons. But they, you know, to Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal journalists, they're terrifying because it's a gun in camouflage colors because that's how 
hunters are. Here's a snippet of that police press conference that was on the eve of the Emergencies Act. And that's why I think it's evident in retrospect it was a pretext for Trudeau to put the country under martial law. Here's how the police described it back then. Our members uh, have been up here, and in general, uh, we haven't had many incidents involving violence. But unfortunately, an investigation started uh, uh, after a period of time when the initial protesters arrived. Shortly thereafter, we began to receive imminent information of potential threats. It took some time to investigate that and to uh, determine facts which have led us to uh, several arrests during the night last night. These arrests and this investigation is continuing. We have since made another arrest involving this. Uh, The escalation of violence towards the members, including having someone break one of our checkpoints this afternoon and uh, just about hit one of our members on the road. So we certainly have concerns about how this has uh, developed and our investigation into what could be a number of different charges and a number of different acts has created a situation where we're investigating conspiracy to attempt to commit murder. And then we have other investigations involving uh, the firearms, clearly. So a search warrant was conducted last night in the air, it was at approximately midnight, 1230, where three trailers associated to a group that had arrived separate to the original protesters, but in, ended up being a part of this whole situation. And this group, we conducted a search warrant into three trailers associated to them, resulting in the seizure of weapons, firearms, ammunition, as well as uh, body-worn armor that would normally be a police issue. And these people were taken into custody. We have determined that the investigation is ongoing and we will continue to investigate this uh, for the safety of the public and for the safety of the police. You know, today while I was sitting in the court, I reread some old CBC articles about the Coots 4 and these charges. And reading it again with what I know now, it's so clear that so much of it is just hearsay or speculation or the sort of fever dream of the uh, police media industrial complex. They always had this fantasy that the truckers were violent, that it was going to be a January 6th insurrection, which, by the way, itself was not particularly violent. There were some broken windows for sure, but the only person who was murdered that day was one of the protesters, Ashley Babbitt, if I recall her name. Uh, But still, uh, January 6th uh, in uh, U.S. liberal circles was this terrifying event where we almost lost our democracy. Trudeau and the media industrial complex wanted that narrative for these truckers. It never came. So they were desperate to find that. And they thought they found it in the Coots 4. And frankly, it was so shocking, this talk of conspiracy to murder a policeman, that not only did they arrest the four men, but the rest of the peaceful protesters said, yikes, we're out of here. We didn't sign up for this. And the men voluntarily shut the Coots blockade down, which, by the way, is an important point. The Windsor Bridge was cleared before the martial law was invoked. Peacefully, local police could handle it. The Coots blockade was cleared voluntarily by the men saying, we're out of here if there were guns. And but the, but Trudeau almost hated that. In fact, you might recall, we've heard this many times, including at the public inquiry into the Emergencies Act, that the city of Ottawa had negotiated a deal with the truckers, that they would move a number of trucks away and they would move them out of residential areas. When Trudeau heard that, he pulled the trigger on the Emergencies Act because he didn't want the temperature to be reduced. He didn't want a negotiated solution. He wanted to be able to claim, uh-huh, we have our January 6th moment. So between uh, arresting Tamara Leach in Ottawa and arresting the four men here in in southern Alberta, they thought they had it. I read the information to obtain. That's the police document. And you can see the, the words information to obtain a search warrant. So that's the list of accusations that police bring to a judge ex parte, which means without the other side there, because you need the sneak attack. You need the element of surprise when you're executing a search warrant. And so they showed this document 
to uh, to the judge and say, judge, give us the search warrant. And the judge did. And this document, it's subject to a publication ban with certain exceptions. You can get the entire document for yourself from the court, and I've done that, but you cannot publish it. So I cannot show you most of what's in it. Certain parts have been given, uh, the judge has unsealed them and allowed them to be published. But I, I don't want to muck around there, but some of the some some of the allegations and accusations in the information to obtain really are dramatic. And I thought to myself, there's really no way that this many cops would be liars for Trudeau. But then, if you, as you know, a few months ago, two of the Coots Four were released on the most modest, the most minor charges, that if they had been the charges from the outset, these men would never have spent a day in jail. They would have had their wrist slapped, maybe their gun license taken away for a few years, and that's it. So they have two men left, and those two men were on trial today. The formal trial itself has not yet begun. They're still doing preliminary matters, and alas, they are covered by a publication ban too, so I can't really get into it. Very frustrating to hear very dramatic things being said, but without the ability to report on them or even to characterize them as good for the prosecution or good for the defense. The reason for this publication ban, when you think about it, it's to preserve the trial itself so that any potential jurors don't have uh, little shreds or shards of evidence in their minds. Oh, I know all about this. They're bad dudes. Or I know all about this. They're good dudes. If you if they heard a police report, if they heard a lawyer on the other side, like if they had some information in advance of the trial, they would probably go in with their mind partly made up. And they might just have an out-of-context fact or something like that. My point is... It's important that the evidence that is being heard today, while very interesting, has to be withheld from prospective jurors until it's properly put to them so they hear all of it, not just a journalist's summary, so they can hear if a lawyer challenges its credibility so they can make up their mind. It's frustrating that we can't publicize what is being said today, but understand the reason is actually to protect the jury. So it's one of the few cases uh, where a, a ban on freedom of expression, it's temporary and it's for the higher purpose of justice. So I hate to say it, it's actually a good idea to have that publication ban, even though it makes it frustrating for many people. One of the things people do to get around that is they come and watch the trial. And alas, we're all jammed into a small courtroom, never enough room. They say the larger courtroom is under renovations. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's frustrating to the people. Anyways, there's only two of the Coots Four remaining, because like I said, the other two copped a plea bargain a few months ago, and they were for minor offenses, and I don't know if those men would have signed literally anything to get out of jail for two years. If two of the best years of your life are stolen in jail, you probably would sign just about anything to get back to your life and your family, even if it was false. But I I don't know if if it was a forced jailhouse confession, as they call it. Even if we take it at face value, those two men are out in the world. So obviously the government doesn't think they're a menace to society anymore. So why are the other two still in jail if their so-called co-conspirators have been let off to go back into the public? Like, What is the danger in March 2024 of these two remaining members of the Coots Four if the other two Coots Four are out and about? Like it, that alone doesn't make sense. Um. As you know, the other day I sat down with Betty Carbert, the mother of one of the two remaining accused. Here's a a short excerpt from that interview. Take a look. I do not believe now what I believed then. I do not believe your son did what the police said he did. And I actually think he's been falsely accused. And I think you're right. It was a shock to, to me because everybody might say that I'm his mom, and so I'm a little biased, but I also, because I'm his mom, I feel that I know him best. Because of that, I, I know that Chris couldn't possibly participate in what he's being accused of for, for many reasons. I want to talk about those reasons because yeah. it's true. Every mother loves their son. Every mother remembers their son as a baby yeah. and as a little boy. And even the mothers of actual criminals feel that way. But I want to talk a little bit. Let's start with Chris and who he is and how he wound up at the blockade, because he was one of the peaceful protesters there. He just also was one of the four who were swept up in this RCMP raid. Tell me about how it started. Why did he go to the blockade? Why did he go to this protest? 
And what did he tell you about it? Was he in touch with you during the protest? What do you know about that? Yeah, he, he, um, he would text me probably every day just to keep me up to date on what was happening. Uh, he was there because of the truckers. Like he, he felt that um, the COVID mandates, it was affecting everybody. Anybody with a business where they were depending on products going and coming from the US and the truckers having to find, well, probably new jobs because the ones that wouldn't uh, take the shot could no longer go across the border. So he was there to support them. What we were talking about there was the difference between the two remaining accused, Tony Olenek and Chris Carbert. And I know that there is a general solidarity with all of these men, that we don't like the prosecution of them, that it's all politically revved up. And I think that's true. But there is an enormous difference between what Chris Carbert said and did and what Tony Olenek said and did. And I, I don't know if in the name of political unity and harmony, we should discount some of the crazy things that Tony Olenek said to undercover officers that, you know, were obviously or probably just BS, just puffery, just a, a guy showing off. Like, remember in that saloon in Coots, Coots is such a small place. All the men sort of hung out in this one saloon. It's where they met. It's where they talked. It's where they ate and drank. And people could come and go. And there were uniformed police officers in there, but there were also plenty of undercover officers, including attractive enough young women. And so you've got these men who have just been cramped up with other men for a week or two, and these attractive young women are hanging on their every word. And there's a male instinct. I might have even had it once in my life myself. When you're meeting a young woman, you want to show off a little bit. You want to be a little tougher than you are, a little braver than you are. You want to embellish your stories just a wee bit. I don't know. I think it's an, a male instinct, even more than a female instinct. And so one of the defendants, Tony Olenek, told big stories. And again, I'm not referring to anything I've heard in court, but rather to things that have been published due to the court revising the publication ban, Tony Olenek wouldn't stop running his mouth about what they were planning and what they were doing and what how they would fight back. And he used language that I think seasoned police commanders would say, oh, that's just BS. That's just a guy showing off for girls. But remember what the times were like in mid-February 2022. There was enormous pressure by Trudeau on the police to find him something, anything. Remember they had that hoax of, oh, and the truckers lit an arson attack in a condo in Ottawa. I don't know if you remember about that. Complete hoax. They had the hoax of the swastika flag. By the way, it's clear that the media doesn't care about anti-Semitic flags. We've had anti-Semitic flags at Hamas hate marches for six months. CBC hasn't done an expose on that yet. But like I say, the police were hunting, hunting, hunting for anything. And here's this guy in a saloon bragging to a couple of undercover female officers about his plans for a revolution. Yeah, you bet they're going to say go with it, even though he's a BSer, even though there's no evidence of it. We got to give something to the boss. The boss, of course, being Justin Trudeau and his crooked RCMP commissioner at the time, um, Brenda Lucky. And I think that that old World War II saying, loose lips sink ships, I think that's what happened here. Now, perhaps I'm not showing the solidarity with Tony Olenek that uh, one would want me to do, but I listen, if he did commit the crime of conspiracy to commit murder, then he should do the time. I just don't believe he did that. Um, I was thinking about the elements necessary to convict someone of uh, conspiracy to commit murder, and this is beyond a reasonable doubt. First of all, you need another person. That's why I think they've trapped Chris Carpenter there. But second of all, not only do you have to have the intention to commit this murder, you have to agree to do it. Not just, hey, it's an idle plan or wouldn't be it be neat if, or maybe we'll do You have to, okay, are we agreed? Are we going to do this? Yes, go. I just don't believe that the cops have that. And I think that they've been stretching this out to punish everyone. Trudeau is extremely vengeful. He has vendettas like that. If you cross him, he will take it out of your hide. He did to Tamara Leach. He did to Pastor Arthur Pavlovsky. And I think that may be what's going on in here. We're going to cover this. We're going to, one of our mottos in Rebel News is follow the facts wherever they lead. And there are some troubling facts here. I do not believe that um, two years in prison uh, 
is appropriate for a guy just being a blowhard and a braggart. And based on what's emerged in recent months, including the plea deal, I don't think Tony Olenek had a conspiracy to commit murder. I think he had just a big mouth, and that was enough for the government to go to war against these truckers. We'll find out. Unfortunately, I can't tell you more of what's going on inside there because it's covered by a publication, Matt. I'm delighted to say that Robert Krejcik, our reporter who covered the Tamara Leach trials, is going to be here for the duration of the Cooch 4 and the Cooch 3. And and he's he you, you've seen his work with Tamara Leach, and I think he's really the right fit for this. So that's my report from here. By the way, if you want to chip into the Legal Defense Fund for Chris Carbert, we've set up a special fund for him at helpchris.ca. So feel free to chip in if you think that he, he was overcharged and this is a political trial. That's my report from here in Coots. Mm-hmm.